this lecture, we will be looking at chapter 12, the sculpture chapter. Um, I'm going to deviate a little bit from how um, it's discussed in your chapter or in the textbook. And what we're going to look at first is when you look at sculpture, I, always, I want you to look at it and first determine its dimensionality. And then I want you to look at its method of execution, meaning how is it made. So to start, we have, we're going to look at dimensionality. The first we're going to look at is what's called a relief. Relief sculptures can be viewed only from one side because they are projecting from the background. You can see that in the image here. This is part of the Parthenon frieze. And so you see the figures. However, if you went to the other side, there would be nothing to be seen because this is literally attached to the background. Um, this also method has less restrictions in engineering than the full round sculpture because literally this is attached to the background. Relief sculptures are three-dimensional, but they do maintain some two-dimensional qualities, um, meaning that they are, at least on one side that's attached, flat. Um, we have what's called low relief or base relief, which you can see here. And this is where the, um, the sculpture itself is only projected just a slight bit from the background. And then we have what's called high relief or hot relief. And this is where the sculpture is projected by at least half their depth. So you can see here, looking at the pediment on the New York Stock Exchange, the figures almost seem as if they are individual sculptures, but they're actually still relief. They are actually still attached to the background. Um, I always put this little side in here because we were talking about contrapposto. Um, contrapposto is um, how the human form naturally tends to stand. And naturally, we tend to stand with our weight shifted on one side. Therefore, part of the body is in tension, part of the body is relaxed. You see this little cartoon because most Egyptian, ancient Egyptian works, the figures were these very straight up and down and then you can see the figure in the center where he's standing in contrapposto, and you can see how it makes it seem more lifelike. And I always just thought this was entertaining, so I put it in there. All right, the next um, that you're going to look at with dimensionality is full round. Now, a full round sculpture is one that is freely standing and fully three-dimensional. Think about it this way, that you can fully walk around the entire work. Because of this, unlike the relief where there's really only one main way to view it, in the full round, you're going to have different angles from every side. Also with full round environments, the creator must keep in mind the practicalities of engineering and gravity. So what you're looking here, this is a sculpture of Apollo and Daphne by Bernini. It is made out of marble, 1622 to 1625. This was during the Baroque era. Um, and what happens with this? The story behind this with Apollo and Daphne was Apollo, uh, the sun god, he was actually kind of making fun of Cupid. Like, oh, aren't you so cute? You know, you and your little arrows. Well, this offended Cupid. So what Cupid did was he actually shot Apollo in the heart with an arrow. And because of this, the next person Apollo saw, he fell madly in love with. Well, he saw Daphne. And what happened then is Cupid then shot Daphne in the heart with a lead arrow. So this made her hate Apollo and wanted nothing to do with him. Um, also along with this, Daphne was also part of the Order of Artemis, where it was um, a group of women who were chaste. So she had no desire to be with Apollo. So Apollo, madly in love with Daphne. Daphne wants nothing to do with him, so she tries to flee. Well, what happens is Apollo follows her and chases her, and what Bernini has shown in this sculpture, it's the moment right before as Apollo is capturing her. Like if you look on her stomach, you can see his hand just starting to wrap around. And what happens is Daphne calls for her father, who was a woodland god, to help her escape Apollo. And so what he does is he actually turns her into a laurel tree. And so you can see this is that moment where she is turning into it. Here you can see another angle. And look at her hands, right? Her hands are turning into the leaves and the branches. Her hair is becoming the leaves. And so this is that moment. Um, because of this, Apollo, the legend has that Apollo still loved her. Um, and that's why he made the laurel tree that she was uh, turned into evergreen. And that's why Apollo always wears the laurel wreath. So he always has part of her with him. 
But back to the idea of the sculpture, right? So again, this is that moment Bernini has captured, yet he has to also keep the engineering in mind. So look at the base of this. Do you see how wide that is? And we can see Daphne's legs are turning into the trunk of the tree. If you look at this, right, if he had just made her legs normal, think of the engineering. This is made of marble. It would have been top heavy, and so it would have fallen over. So with these full round sculptures, um, the artist also has to keep in mind, right, the engineerings of it so it can be functional. All right, your textbook then talks some of what's called environments. Um, these are sculptural spaces where you can physically enter into and explore. Um, they can be either indoors or outdoors, but somehow they're contained, such as in a plaza. We'll see in a minute. Um, an example of this, we'll go back to that one. This was from your textbook. This is a Nursto Nettos uh, Taurus Mako Coppola in the Louis Vuitton store in Tokyo from 2012 and 2013. And what this was is it was thousands of plastic balls suspended in netting that was then hung from the ceiling. And the idea is that you are meant to walk through it. And you can actually look. You can see the people standing in line to walk through it. And then look about halfway up. Somebody's actually fallen. And so the idea within this, with this sculpture, is that the mind and the body become one. Thus, we, the, the artist says, thus as we walk precariously along the catwalk, suspended in space, tottering, grasping for balance, our body-mind becomes acutely aware of itself. And you see that in work such as this one. Uh, this is Richard Serra's The Matter of Time from 2005. Um, it was an installation of seven sculptures of weatherproof steel, and it was in the Guggenheim Museum in Bilboa, Spain. And if you look in the back right, you can see there's a person walking there. So you can see how, I, how large this was. And so the idea behind this one was that, it was that the viewer would walk through the plates and the plates slowly start to come in so they become almost impassable. And the idea is that as you become more and more aware of the space that you're in, right, time itself seems to either speed up or slow down and you become more aware of your space. An example of that, think if you were, you know, walking down the hallway of your school or your work, and all of a sudden the hallway started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You would become much more aware of the space that you're in. And that's what he's doing within this work. So this is an example of these environmentals. Um, we'll talk about earthworks here in a little bit. Um, earthworks, these are large-scale outdoor environments, which are made of the land itself. So we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about Richard Serra's a different sculpture, and that's called Tilted Ark, and that's what you see right here. So Tilted Ark was actually installed in 1981, and it was commissioned by the federal government. And what it was, it was this large piece of weatherproof steel that was 12 feet by 120 feet, and it was two and a half feet thick. And it was actually placed in the Federal Plaza in Washington, D.C., and what happened was this was commissioned by the federal government as part of a program for supplying and supporting public art. Well, what happens is that with this work, after it was installed, people hated it. They said, you know, it blocked the space because the image we're looking at, um, it's right in front of the federal plaza, the federal building in Washington, D.C. So the photograph we're looking at, it's taken from inside the building. And so people were complaining that this tilted arc um, actually blocked the entrance and people had to be, you know, walk around it. Well, for Sarah, that was exactly his point. He wanted people to become aware of the space they were in while having to walk around this giant piece of steel made them aware of where um, their space. So what happens is people complained and complained and there was actually a movement to get rid of tilted arc. So what the government said was, well, we'll just move it to another location. And Sarah actually fought that because he said no. He designed this specific piece of art to be in this specific space. And that if you moved it somewhere else, it would destroy the meaning and the message of the artwork. So it's a very interesting story. There was um, a lot of court cases fought over this. And eventually what happened is it was removed in 1989 and it was destroyed because Sarah said he would not sign off on it being placed anywhere else. 
All right, so that's dimensionality. Now we're going to look at methods of execution, meaning how are these works made? So the first we're going to talk about is what's either called carving or subtraction. Here what we begin is the work is some large block of material and the artist literally subtracts away the unwanted materials. So you can see that here. This is uh, very famously Michelangelo's David. Um, it was created between 1501 and 1504 and it is marble. And it's interesting because Michelangelo says he did not create David, that he freed him from the block that he was already there. Um, historically, sculptors have worked with whatever materials were available. Stone has been the most popular. Why? Because it's the most durable. Um, igneous stone includes granite. It is, does have a very hard mass. However, it is very difficult to work with. Then you have sedimentary. This includes limestone, which is abundant here in Kentucky. Um, it is durable. It carves very easily and actually polishes very well. And then we have metamorphic, and this is probably the most ideal, um, and marble is part of this. It's long-lasting, it's durable, it carves easily, and it actually also exists in a broad range of color. So again, what happens with subtraction or carving? The artist, you know, starts with a large block. Usually they create an exact model of what they want to use out of clay, or plaster, or wax. And then they start cutting out sections with tools. Once they get down to about two to three inches of where they want to be, they're going to use much smaller, much more detailed um, tools. And you can see that in the work here. This is you, the great, taming the waters. Um, this is made out of jade. In fact, it's the largest known uh, single piece of jade ever found. Um, this took seven years and eight months to complete. Now, it is a full round sculpture, right? We can fully walk around it, see it from different angles. But what's interesting, if you kind of zoom in on your own, you can see it's also covered with what we could argue are relief sculptures. And then here is a last carved piece. Um, this is by Donatello. Um, it's called Magdalene Petnet. Um, and it's uh, circa 1453 to 1455. And this was actually made out of wood, out of white poplar. Pop, poplar, sorry. All right, next we're going to move on to what's called modeling or manipulation. And this is where the artist takes pliable materials and they are shaped by the artist's hands or tools. You know, think of a potter's wheel. Clay is the most common. Why? It's a natural material that is found worldwide. It can be manipulated and then it retains its shape. However, clay to become waterproof and more durable, it needs to be what's called fired. And this is where you bake it normally between 1200 to 2700 degrees Fahrenheit in a kiln or an oven. And again, this causes it to become hard and then waterproof. And this is what we call ceramics. Um, here's another work here. This is Case of Bottles. And you can see in this work, if you look at it, it looks old and cracked. Um, this was done very intentionally. The artist, Ro uh, Robert um, Arnson, intentionally overcooked this so it got this kind of weathered old look. And then here's an example of a massive work of um, using modeling or manipulation. These are images of figures taken from the tomb of Qin Shi Hong, who was the first emperor of China. Um, he was famous because he unified the country under one code of law. Uh, this was the emperor who actually was uh, responsible for the building of the Great Wall. And when his tomb was discovered, it actually contained more than 6,000 life-size, lifelike figures of ceramic soldiers and horses. These were there because they were meant to be the mortal bodyguards for the emperor. Um, it also contains some clerks, scribes, and other court figures. But what is really, really neat about this is these are all individual. It's not just they made one mold and kept making it. You can see here in some of the details that each one is an individual human. Um, on the left, I also included a work. Um, this is a set of bronze horses and the chariot uh, that was also within the tomb. So talking about bronze... We'll move to our next method of execution, and this is what's called substitution or casting. Um, casting, it also can be called replacement. So what happens in this, this form is where you transfer a material from a fluid state into a solid state. Now this method of execution always involves a mold. 
Um, the process, basically what happens is you create an identically sized model for the intended sculpture. You cover this with a positive material, for example, plaster. Um, when that's hardened, it remove, it's removed and it retains the surface configuration. This is what we call the negative and this becomes the mold. Then we put it back together. The material is somehow poured in the mold and when it is hardened and removed, you have the piece. Then you can polish it, finish it if you need to. Um, bronzes are probably the most popular example of this, which you can see here. And here, the textbook talks about what's called the lost wax technique. Um, this is the thinker that is on University of Louisville's Belknap campus. This was originally made, first made in Paris. Um, this one, there are, I think, eight copies of it. This was made by Rodin, and I think there are eight copies. However, this one was the only one that was cast using this lost wax technique. And that's what I've actually included for you, this YouTube video. So you'll have to exit the lecture, go to the posted slides, and watch this video. But it's actually a video showing you the lost wax technique. Um, I think it's much easier to understand when you actually see it. Um, another example of material that is used in this method of execution it's, um, is fiberglass. And so here you see an example of a fiberglass sculpture. All right, next we're going to go to the fourth uh, method of ex execution, and this is what's called assemblage or construction. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You start with a small amount of raw material and you add the elements together. So the idea of an assemblage it literally means the process of bringing individual objects or pieces together to form a larger whole. So this is what's called a built sculpture, works executed with construction method. And you can see that here with the Statue of Liberty, right? When the Statue of Liberty came from France, it was in many separate pieces and literally had to be constructed. And now we can even talk about the pedestal that she is on. This is a building, but it was also constructed. Um, another example, this is by Louise Nevelson. It's called Sky Cathedral, 1958, and it is wood painted black. Now what she would do is, this is a, cre um, a, um, a collection of what's called found objects, meaning literally objects she would go out and find. And what she was very interested in was she would go to these um, furniture factories, and she would go and just pick up the discarded pieces of wood. So that's what she's done here. She's placed them all in these wood boxes, and then she paints the entire work black. So by painting it all this one solid color, right, it's in a way that it makes it unified. Because if you look at this, this is made up of hundreds of small little pieces. Um, what she was doing with this is that she actually wanted them to reflect the idea of altar pieces. So while this work is technically a full round, it also has some of those relief qualities because if we stood behind it, we would just see the flat boxes. Where on from the front angle where we're seeing, you know, we see a totally different view. Um, another example of a uh, built work, this is a puppy by Jeff Coons. Um, it was from 1992. It's made of stainless steel, soil, geotextile geo fabric, um, an internal irrigation system, and then live flowering plants. And so what was interesting with this, it was actually installed in front of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilboa, Spain. And what he does here was this is a work that also would uh, develop over time. It's kind of like a giant chia pet, right? When he first created it, you didn't see the flowers. But as time went on, the flowers grew and they bloomed. You used to get the puppy that we see here. All right, so those are the four methods of execution. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about installations. Um, installations, these are... Um, works that introduce sculptural and other materials into a space in order to transform our experience of it. Here is a very famous one. This is called Cloud Gate, um, commonly known as the Bean. It was created by Anish Kapoor in 2004, and it is made of stainless steel, and it's in the Millennium Park in Chicago. This actually weighs over 100 tons. And so what the artist was trying to do is they were definitely trying, he was definitely trying to change our awareness and our experience of the space. And so what he says, 
He says, what I wanted to do in Millennium Park is make something that would engage the Chicago skyline so that one will see the clouds kind of floating in with those very tall buildings reflected in the work. And then, since it is the form of a gate, the participant, the viewer, will be able to enter into this very deep chamber that does, in a way, something to one's reflection as the exterior of the piece is doing to the reflection of the city around. So to experience this, you are literally supposed to walk through to walk under it there. And it's intentionally made to change how you experience the space. All right, next we're going to go back to these ephemeral or environmental or earthworks. These are all kind of the same name. And what they are, they're these large outdoor environments um, that are referred to as these earthworks. And what happens is the artists take natural materials and they create the work out of it. So the example you see here, this is Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, and it's in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, this was created in 1969 to 1970. It's made of black rock, salt, crystals, earth, and red water. And what, under, what happens with this, it's made of the natural material. So over time, it is going to naturally erode and deteriorate. And you can see at the image in the bottom right that depending on the time of the year, sometimes when the lake floods, you can barely see the work, or at times it's completely covered up. And so that's part of what is meant with this earthwork. In fact, Smithson said that he understood over time that the earthwork would be subject to the vast changes in the water level that characterized the Great Lake itself. And so that's part of the work. Um, also, the book quickly talks about what's called found objects or found sculptures or objects to art. Um, I always think this is a very interesting concept because the idea is these were works of art that were not created by man, they were created by nature and they're just found in nature. Um, think of like driftwood, stone sculptures, stuff as that. However, what's very interesting is the argument, well, once we take these, you know, think of a driftwood sculpture, you know, once we take it off of the, you know, the beach where it drifted up and we put it somewhere and say it's art, have we not already profoundly changed it? Um, so something, you know, discuss that on your own. Uh, the text then discusses performance art as living sculpture, but we've already pretty much discussed that um, when we discussed chapter 24. So do make sure you read uh, that section on your own. Now I have some other things here I want you to look at. Um, when we talk about sculpture, you can talk about all of your elements and principles of composition that we've mainly used to look at you know, painting up to this point. I want you to think about also when you're looking at these works about the lighting and the environment they are in. For example, here you're looking at Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, it opened in 1982, and it is black granite, and it's 493 and a half feet, and it's in Washington, D.C. And so part of Lin's design of this is very, very intentional playing with the environment it's in. As you walk in it, you go kind of lower into the ground, so literally you're going in and coming out of the war and how it's um, presented on the National Mall in Washington is one end points to the Washington Memorial, one end, or I'm sorry, the Washington Monument, and one end points to the Lincoln Memorial. And you can see that here. Um, other works that take into this environment, here you're looking at reflecting absence. This is one of the 9-11 memorials. This is the one in New York City. Um, reflecting absence, he very much took the environment into account because, you know, this is in downtown Manhattan, which is very loud. And what Michael Rod did with these waterfalls, they're waterfalls that were placed where the footsteps of the Twin Towers were. Um, they're actually the largest man-made waterfalls in North America. And what he wanted is when you stand there, the sound of the waterfalls kind of blanks out downtown Manhattan, all those noises. So you become acutely aware of the space that you're in. So I want you to look just at some of the other slides and think about um, how these other elements of composition, um, elements of principles of composition, are used within the works. And so think about that as you read the rest of the chapter.